scepter and follow their pattern. So we looked at once again, what is it that keeps us from overcoming the giants? The children of Israel were unable. Now, they're children of promise. Having just come out of, of Egypt, they're on, the, they're on the verge of entering the promised land, but they find out that there's obstacles. There's giants to obtaining the promise. And that's true in everybody's life. There's obstacles to obtaining the promises of God. As a result, they spend 40 years somewhere between the place of bondage and the place of promise. They never fully enter into the promises of God. That generation went to be with the Lord, never knowing fully his promises. I'm not questioning whether or not they were God's people. We would not question whether or not that somebody saved. But we are saying that you could live your whole life and never enjoy the promises of God. Numbers, the 13th chapter, they didn't, you know, that they, they believe the bad report. A bad report is anytime something disagrees with what God says about you or your life or your circumstances. They believed it. They believed a false report. They believed a lie and wept over a lie. Because the people said we're not able. You will find again today that being in the majority will, not, will often not put you on the right side of God. Being in the majority will often not put you on the right side of God. So this morning, talking about continuing along those lines of overcoming your giants, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to teach and to preach your gospel. We're thankful, Father, that your word's good seed, and as it's sown on good ground in our lives, we're believing that it will produce good fruit. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you allow me for a little bit, I'm going to go to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. I'm going to work my way down to where it begins in your bulletin, verse 26. I had more scripture than you can get in the bulletin. That ought to make you afraid. <laughs> now the Philistine gathered their forces for war. I've narrowed these down. So that the Israelites assembled and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistine. The Philistine occupied one hill, the Israelites another, with a valley between them. A champion named Goliath. Everybody say Goliath. Goliath. Everybody has or has had a Goliath in their lives. Israel couldn't go into the promised land because they saw the sons of giants. A giant is anything that stands between you and God. Again, you could have a giant of fear. You could have a giant of unforgiveness. You could have a giant of addiction. You could have a giant of worry. You could have a financial giant. You could have a health giant. There's giants in the land. Giants will stand between you and God's will. They had a champion. And his name was what? was Goliath. Who was from Gath. And he came out of the Philistine camp. Now here's this guy. He's over nine feet tall. It means he can't walk in your house. He's nine feet tall. I had a friend play basketball with. Uh, his name was Butch. Butch was, Butch was six seven. Now I'm six two. He stood a whole head taller than me. I'm six two. He was six seven. All right? This guy was nine foot tall. His coat of mail weighed 125 pounds or more. The spear he carried was at least eight feet long, and the spearhead made of brass was 15 pounds. I'm telling you, he was a lot of guy. He was a big giant see again because we always think our circumstances is worse than anyone else's my problem my disability my 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 addiction my my unemployment my my bills my health we always think our problems are bigger than anyone else's well so did they i mean goliath's a big deal 
But see, the truth of the matter is, if your giants are too big, and then the challenge is, then your God's too small. Now, that's kind of hard to wrestle with for people of faith. If your giants are too big, then you're, you're, you're just saying, my, my, my God, you know, my, my financial problem's too big, my health problem's too big, my, my, my fear problem's too big. Well, then, and then, then God's just too small. It's just, there's no other conclusion to it. Now, we all know that the truth of the matter is, is that your giants are never bigger than God. Nine foot tall is no big deal to God. 125 pound coat of mail is, is no big deal to God. An eight foot spear with a 15 pound head on the end of it that he could probably throw like a laser. It's still, it's, it's no big deal to God. If your giants are too big, and again, your God's too small. 1 Corinthians 17, 8 through 11, we just continue to read. And he says, and then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Let's say and you come to a point in your life, you're going to believe for change. You're going to believe something's going to change. I'm going to trust God, all right? I'm going to overcome my fear. I'm going to overcome my worry. I'm going to overcome my financial problems. I'm going to overcome my addiction. I'm going to overcome my family problems, my marital problems, my health problems. So you come out and you line up, and then you start hearing it. He says, choose a man from above you. Let him come down. And if he's able, fight with me and kill me. And then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. Now, this would be one thing if this was day one. If this was just day one, and this great big gorilla of a guy comes out to in, just to, to just to cause fear to go through the camp of Israel. But you know what day this is? It's day 40. We go out every day, we line up for battle, and we do nothing. But we go out, and we go to church, and we line up for battle, but we what? We do nothing. You imagine they line up every day to take this verbal abuse? Verbal abuse. He mocks them. He makes fun of them. We get a lot of that up here, don't we? The enemy. Everybody say the enemy. Yeah. See, Goliath represents what? The enemy. He mocks us. We get verbal, emotional, or spiritual abuse. It comes from within, it comes from without. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were what? Greatly afraid. You never overcome if fear controls your life. Then Jesse said to his son David, You know, in the meantime, I want you to know they ran backward. All right? Take now your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. Carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand. And see how your brothers fare. Bring back news. Jesse's got ten sons. David's the youngest. The three oldest are at battle. So David rose early in the morning and he came to the camp where the army was out to the fight and and the shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn a, in a battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the keeper, and he ran to the army, and he came, and he, he greeted his brothers. Now David spoke to the men who stood by him, said, What shall be done to this man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? Then he says this. Oh, you know what? David's 15. He's, he's 15. You know any 15-year-olds got giants in their lives? Yeah. 
didn't make any difference which you are. Giants are indiscriminate. They're equal opportunity harassment. What shall be done to the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the approach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? This is what he's saying. This guy doesn't have no relationship with God. That he should defy the armies of the, the living God. Now, Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was aroused against David and he said, why did you come down here? He's saying this, David, that talk embarrasses me. You're embarrassing the family. You are an embarrassment. You often find when you take a stand, sometimes you will have as much resistance from within to those that are closest to you to those that are from without. Eliab said to So why why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's letting him know, you know. You're just barely capable, just barely capable of taking care of just a few head of sheep. Who's taking care of them? Uh, He says, "I, I know your pride and your insolence in your heart. For you've come down to see this battle. Hey, do you know what's already happened in this story? That's often overlooked? Ah, there was an old prophet named Samuel. Had visited their house. Looked at all Jesse's son. knew Knew that the future king of Israel was right there in the house. Marched all the kids behind him. You know, in front of him. One at a time. From the eldest to the youngest. Eliab's one of them. He was the first one to be looked over. Yeah. Now, he sure don't want to see anything good happen in David's life because God's passed over him, he thinks. I said, I know your pride, your insolence, your heart. And you've come, you've come down to see the battle. You're like a person running to the fire or the wreck. You just want to see what's going to happen. And David said, oh, what have I done now? Now listen to this. He says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? See, when you've got giants in your life, there is a cause. That is the cause. See, the cause is Goliath. Goliath is intimidating them. Goliath is, is, is going to bring about defeat in their lives. Their demise is going to come about. Many of them are going to be lost in battle. They're either going to be lost in battle or they see themselves as becoming slaves. They're just on the sidelines waiting to see what's going to happen. Forty days, they line up every day. They take the verbal abuse day after day. Is there not a cause? Yeah, David said, there's a cause, man. There's a giant here. They've gone all this time. They've not done anything about the giant. You know why? Because we get used to the giant. You know, if you're not careful, you get used to depression. You get, you get, you get used to fear. You, you become accustomed to your financial problem. You'll be, you'll be accustomed to your spiritual struggle. I, it becomes easier to live with it than it does live without it, at least in our minds. Is there not a cause? I, <laughs> then he turned from him toward another. Now when the words which, uh, which David had spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, he said, I'll let no man's heart fail because of him. Because of who? I want you to notice, he doesn't spend any time talking about what a giant he is, what a big guy he is, how bad his problems are, how difficult it is. Let me say that again. David didn't spend any time talking about how hard it was, how difficult it was, how insurmountable the odds were. He called him uncircumcised, and in his second reference, he just calls him him. He said, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight what? The Philistine. You know Philistine means somebody gets down and rolls in the dirt. Yeah. Don't get, ever get down and roll in the dirt with them. 1733. Saul said to David, Oh my. You are not able. Notice, Saul said, You are not able. What did Saul say? You are not able. Well, now, you'll find that the Scripture is always consistent both with fear and with faith. 
Remember the, the, the 12 spies or the 10 spies that went into the land? There was 12 of them, Joshua and Caleb, who believed God. But then there were the 10 who had the evil report. And remember, they said, we are not able. The people heard their report. They cried. They believed the false report. Saul says, let me speak some reason to you, son. You are not able. Now listen, it doesn't make any difference if people are talking about facts or lies. You're still able. Even if the facts say, the facts in this story is, is that he does not have the capacity to overcome the giant as a 15-year-old kid. But he believes in this thing called a living God. You're not able to go up against the Philistine and fight him. You're what? You're a youth. <laughs> Can you imagine David standing there? King, all right. He got all his armor on. He's standing there with all his glory. He tells him, you are not able. You're a child. And he's thinking, you've been standing here taking this for 40 days. Who do you tell me I'm a kid? Who are you to tell me I'm a kid? You've been standing here taking this for 40 days. You don't have nothing to do with being a youth. And it doesn't have anything with being too old. Well, I'm too old. Well, get over being too old. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're not a dog. Somebody say amen. He said, my goodness. He said, you're a youth and he is a man. He's a man of war from his youth. Now listen. Obedience is not doing what you're qualified to do. It's doing what you're called to do. It's not doing what you're able to do. It's doing what you're called to do. It's not doing even what you're equipped to do. It's doing what you're called to do. He said, what? See, you're not able. See, it doesn't make any difference if you're 15 like David or if you're 85 like Caleb. Caleb endured 40 years in the wilderness to go into the promised land. At 85 years old, he says to Joshua, that mountain in Hebron, it's mine. At 85 years old, Caleb goes in and defeats the giants that the others refused to 40 years later. You're never too old to overcome. You're never too young to overcome. And it takes care of everybody in between. Victory is not dependent upon your age, your circumstance, your background, your ethnicity, your education, your wealth, the abundance of or lack of. Listen, there'll always be someone to say this. You're too something. You're too young, you're too old, you're too broke, you're too poor, you're too tired, you're too fearful, you're too secluded, you're too heavy, you're too pretty, whatever the deal may be. I'll always be somebody to tell you, you are too something. I said, David, you're just too young. Well, then it says in verse, we drop down to verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones. Great part of the story. Most of you know, you know, already have an idea where this is. This is great. He stops. He grabs five stones. Well, first of all, maybe he's going to grab five stones because he thinks he's going to miss. And he's going to need at least five shots to kill him. But maybe he's planning on killing more than one. You know what David is? David's an army of one. He's an army of one. He's 15 years old. He's an army of one. Yeah. He grabs five stones. We learn later, if you go, I believe, the 21st chapter, we find out that Goliath had four more brothers. Four more brothers. All right? Yeah. 
let me tell you what. As long as you hang around with the people who say you can't, you can't. When they got to hanging around David, you know, David never killed another giant because once you kill one giant, the giants leave you alone. But his men, the ones that would, that day said, oh, we can't. Well, we're afraid. We, oh, we're not able. They killed the other four because when you hang around somebody who can defeat giants, you become a person who becomes a giant killer. Can you say amen? amen. Yeah. So as long as you hang around with the I can't, I won't, I'm stuck, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm not that smart, I'm not that rich, I'm not that, not that spiritual. He took a staff in his hand, took five smooth stones from the stream, he put them in his pouch, in his shepherd's bag, in his sling. What's he? You would call this guy ill-equipped, but remember it doesn't have anything to do with being equipped. They tried to put Saul's armor on him. Can you imagine what he looked like with Saul's armor? It'd be like my grandkids putting on my clothes. He looked kind of silly. It was probably funny. Yeah. Saul put this, this, this helmet on him, you know, and, and the eyes came down to here, you know. Yeah. And he put his breastplate on him, and his breastplate came down below his knees. You know, you know Saul was about 6'1", 6'2". He's a big guy. David, he took that stuff off. He says, my goodness. He said, I can't wear this. I, you know, I can't even move. And he grabs what? He, well, he, you know, here's the deal. This is what's good about God. You'll say, when I get to the place that I have, when I get to the place that I know, when I get to the place that I understand, see, if you're always waiting to get to another place for God to do something in your life, you never get to that place. God uses him right where he's at with what he has. So he's got his pouch, he's got his staff, and he's got a sling in his hand. And he approaches the Philistine. Now listen to this. Don't ever be discouraged about your circumstances because sometimes God uses his least for his greatest glory. He uses his least for his greatest glory. Verse 42, now Goliath, he looks David over and he saw that he was only a boy, ruddy, handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog? David's thinking, yeah. <laughs> Did you come at me with sticks? Oh, you know, I forgot to tell you. Remember David? Remember the shepherd? Just taking care of a few sheep. Yeah, one time a lion came in and tried to take the sheep. David slew the lion, took the sheep back. A bear came in, and he slew the bear. Now, you know what? If you saw a lion coming at Goliath, and you'd think, all right, Goliath's got a fighting chance against the lion. And if you saw a bear going at Goliath, you'd say, well, Goliath maybe got a fighting chance against the bear. But now David... You think he's got no chance at all. Except bear's dead, lion's dead, David's alive, Goliath's in trouble. <laughs> Let me tell you this. If you want to have some public victories in your life, you need to allow God work in you and have some private victories. They're no less significant. They're no less large. Here we go. He says... He says, I'm a dog, you come at me with sticks and Philistines. Cursed David by his God, said, come here. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Well, now, if you're Israel and you're standing back and you're watching this and you're thinking, this is not going to be pretty. This could be ugly. This could be the Dodgers and the Cubs last night. <laughs> ah, shouldn't have said that probably. I'm always for the Midwest. <clears throat> Listen, this is what you don't do. If you're going to be an overcomer, you don't let your giant intimidate you. Don't let the giant intimidate you. All right? Don't let the fear intimidate you. Don't let the lack of experience intimidate you. Don't let the, the lack of position or the lack of money or the lack of age. Don't let the what? Don't let the giant intimidate you. Listen, 
Every giant killer knows this. He knows how to use this, the word. Now we can talk and we can say a lot of inspirational stuff about being a giant killer, but you finally you've got to come down to the how-to. Again, don't be intimidated. Don't listen to other people's report. But then you've got to know what to do, and here it is. It's the what. Now I'm going to preface this. I can't say enough things this morning about this part of the message to tell you everything you need to know to be successful. I'll just light a fire. On Wednesday nights, we're talking about the spoken word. It's been a long time since I've just taught on the spoken word. Every person who's a giant killer knows how to use the word. In Joshua 14.10, Caleb, how old is he? 85. I am this day 85 years old. As of yet, I'm as strong. This day is on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is my strength for war. For both going out and what? Everybody say going out and coming in. You know what? He doesn't plan on dying. You like that? He doesn't plan on being defeated. I'm going out and I'm what? And I'm coming in. I don't plan on dying. I'm 85 and I'm not done. You might say, I'm 85 years old. I've seen it all. I've stood at the bank of the Red Sea. I, I saw the Egyptian washed up in it. I saw the cloud, the, you know, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. I've seen it all. I've seen the ground open up and swallow up people. I saw the water come from the rock. I've lived a good life. Except what? He never enjoyed the promises. I'm going out, and I'm coming in. What? He's got what? He's got the word in his mouth. So now I'm just talking about being a positive confession. You know, that, that's all nice, and that's cute, and that might like the business people like you. I'm talking about the faith-filled words. I'm talking about what's in your heart and in your mouth, which is the word of faith. Can you say Amen. He said, for going in and going out. He said, give me what? Give me this mountain. And the Lord will what? Be with me. And I shall be what? In 45 years, he hasn't changed what he believes or says. How long? How long did he not change what he believed and said? Oh, and we get tired because God didn't answer in two weeks. 45 years... He's waited. Victory's always worth it. I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. We go back to Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, 46. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. Now, this is David. He's speaking to the Goliath. Goliath's nine foot tall. He's, got on a, he's on a coat of mail. It's 125 pounds. He's got an eight foot spear. He's got a, got a 15 pound spearhead on it. He has shield so big that it takes one man just to carry it who's out with him. He's already told him what he's going to do. We're going to, you know, we're going to chop you up in little bitty pieces and we're just going to let the birds of the air eat you. This is not going to last long. He said, now not someday. Not someday. Everybody say this day. You know, kind of come a time in your life that you plant your flag. Which day? This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. I'll strike you down. <laughs> it's pretty graphic. I cut off your head. Today, I'll give the carcass of the Philistine army. I'm not just going to whip you. Well, we'll whip the whole lot of you. Listen to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's 15 years old. He's 20 feet tall and 18 feet wide. You know? <laughs> He said, today, I'll give your carcass to the Philistine army, uh, to, the, to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And he said this, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Because Goliath got killed? Uh-uh. Because he got defeated by a 15-year-old kid. 
That's why the whole world's going to... Not because Goliath got killed. I mean, if the whole army just ran at him, they could they could have got him. But David's what? He's an army of one. Because a 15-year-old kid. And the whole world will know once again that there's a, there's a God in Israel. Listen to this. In Ephesians 6.17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation. It's not that he didn't have any armor. He just didn't have physical armor. He had spiritual armor. He says, you know, God's able. You find this, this thing about God being able all the time. Caleb told the, the, the people in, in Numbers the 13th chapter, God is able. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told, told the king, says, our God is able, and he will deliver us out of the fiery furnace. He's what? He's able. See, when you believe in the ability of God, it changes everything else in your, in your life. He's what? He's able. He has, the, he has the wherewith. He has the capacity. He has the ability. And I want you to know he also has the willingness. He's willing. So take the helmet of salvation. See this? And the sword of the Spirit. Everybody say sword of the Spirit. Really, Which is what? What's the sword of the Spirit? A sword of the Spirit is what? Remember in Matthew the fourth chapter? Every time, matter of fact, every time in Matthew the fourth chapter, Satan comes at Jesus and Jesus says to him, It is written. What's that? He's speaking to the, you know, the proverbial giant, except you get, you get it, it's the real deal, it's Satan. He's saying what? It is written. The word's where? It's nigh you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. See, if you don't say the right things, you're not going to win your battle. If you're not in agreement with God, you can't win your battle. If you don't make some sort of expression of faith before nothing changes, you won't win your battle. You can't overcome. You can live somewhere between Egypt and the promised land. Or you can continue to stand on the mountain hoping somebody else goes down the valley and fights, fights for you. You never win your battle. He says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I've underlined sword of the Spirit. And then we take this, this expression. There are two words in the New Testament. The first word in the New Testament often is, the, is it, you'll see the word logos, talking about the living word, for the word of God is alive, alive. In the beginning was the word logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word living became flesh and dwelt among men. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Over and over again, you see many expressions concerning logos, living words, powerful, it's important, it's significant to us. You know, the word of God is not dead. It's alive in your heart. That's why it speaks to people today. It's, what, it's the living word. The word of God speaks to you. Isn't that right? Yeah, when you read it, doesn't it speak to you? Of course it does. Many times when God speaks, he speaks through his word. Why? Because the word does speak when you read it. Now, on the other hand, if his word speaks to us, it would make some sort of sense at some point we should speak his word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, but it's not logos. It's another word. It's rhema, utterance, or it's spoken word. Listen. You can put on a breastplate of righteousness, and you can put on a belt of truth, and shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and put on the helmet of salvation, and listen. If you don't have a spoken word in your mouth... All you're ever going to be in is on defense. It's all you'll ever be is on defense. Huge numbers of Christianity, huge numbers of believers live their whole Christian experience where? On defense. Why? You got to get the what? The spoken word, the rhema. Where? In your mouth. Caleb said, this day I'm 85 years old. Give me this mountain. Because I'm what? I'm able. He's 40 years old. I'm able. David, this day, not next week, not next month, not, next month, not, not wait until I grow up and get me a big army. Don't you, do, wait, until, wait until I become king and see if you try that. When? This day. The Lord will what? Deliver you into my hand. 
All right? I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. Not only you, but your whole army. Do you know that's exactly what happened that day? Goliath fell. The Philistines ran. Israel routed them, plundered them. He had what? Had a word in his mouth. Folks, the power of the spoken word, underutilized. In some quarters of Christianity, there's a certain amount of disdain when you talk about it. Folks, it's filled. It's in the scripture. Don't you know that the words were framed by the what? Word, spoken word of God. Hebrews, the first chapter. We look just a little, a little further. So David prevailed against the Philistine with a what? With a sling and a stone. He struck the Philistine and he killed him. But it says this, but there was no sword in his hand. What's, but there's no sword in his hand. They did, David didn't have a sword in his hand. He had a sword in his mouth. You don't need a sword in your hand. You need a sword where? In your mouth. What? The spoken word of God. The spoken word of God. Look at this, Hebrews 4th chapter. For the word of God is what? It's quick. It's what? It's alive. But it's not only alive, it's powerful. And then the Hebrew writer says, it's sharper than what? Than any two-edged sword. Different day than the day that David's living in by this time that, you know, they're, they're hardening steel or iron. Two-edged sword revolutionized. It was, it, it was a weapon that revolutionized warfare. It was, it was fast. It was quick. It was, it was powerful. It would cut both going in and coming back. It's a two-edged sword. Today we talk about lasers. Then they talked about two-edged swords. He said, for the word of God is quick and it's powerful. And what? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. See, to overcome the giants in your life, you've got to quit the, the I can't. It's too hard. I've tried before. Nobody's for me. Everybody's against me. Nobody's on my side. And David was an army of one. And he was what? And he was 15 years old. 15 years old. Again, the word is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Revelations 12, 11, Those who stand before the throne, and they overcame by the blood of the land, and by what? The word of their testimony. They overcame by his blood, and by what they said. And they did not love their own lives, even unto death. Listen, listen to this. I'm, I'm, I'm at the very end here. Listen here. David said to Saul, all right, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. I read that. Then it went bing. I light went off. He says to Saul, your servant used to keep. Where did he, where did he just come from? Yeah, he just kept from tending sheep, didn't he? He found somebody to take care of him while he was gone. David knew everything was going to change. He's going to have a new job description. David said, I am no longer attached to my past. Do you catch that? I am no longer attached to my past. I used to keep my father's sheep. It's great. I used to keep my father's sheep. You say, I, I, maybe he's thinking he's going to die. No, there's no indication of that. Listen, you'll never defeat your giants unless you expect things to change. David expected everything to change. If you're going to overcome your giant or your giants, you've got to expect things to change. I used to be a shepherd. I'm no longer attached to my past. I'm no longer attached to my past. All right? 
You might have used to been an adulterer, but that's used to. You might have used to been an addict, but that's used to. You understand? Well, I know this goes against some of our stuff. But that isn't what the words say. I don't care what anybody's step says. I don't care what anybody's prayer says. You've got to do what the word says. Can you say amen? I used to be a shepherd. Today I'm done with the past. What am I today? I'm a giant killer. I'm a giant killer. I'm going to defeat my giants. Who showed up today is not going to be the same person tomorrow. Now, again, you might find yourself in the same situation that Caleb did. And you find yourself in circumstances that you don't have full control over. Then you do what Caleb did. You just hang in there. You keep saying the same thing. You keep believing the same thing. Because one of these days, God will honor your faith and honor your faithfulness. And Caleb, he gets to take the mountain. He gets to fully enjoy the promise. You'll never defeat your giants unless you expect to change. I what? I used to be a shepherd. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. Expecting change. The word in your mouth. Don't be intimidated. Don't let the other influences from within or without, don't let the facts or the lies inhibit you from being somebody who obeys God. Ever had bowed, no one's looking around. You might be here this morning. You may have never accepted Christ into your heart. Say, so, Bill, you don't know what I've done. I, you've got to expect change. I've, I've tried this Christianity before. You don't try it, you do it. You live it, you become it. Have you ever, can you believe these things? Can you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Can you believe that he lived and that he died and that he died for you? Can you believe that he was buried and raised from the dead? Have you ever called him Lord of your life? Lots of times people say, well, you know, I've, uh, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's God's son. And I, I do Christmas and Easter. I, I, I do those things. But have you ever called God's son your Lord? Far too many Christians are only looking for somebody to save them and not looking for someone to follow. Jesus is looking for what? He's looking for followers. Followers. He didn't walk by the, uh, picking up disciples and he'd say, I could save you if you let me. I said, come follow me. See, so when you make him the Lord of your life, that causes you to be sa- that's what causes you to be saved. But until he becomes Lord, until we become a Christ follower, we're not saved. I'm not asking you if you've ever been to church. I'm not asking you if you've ever joined one. I'm not asking you if you've ever been baptized. Have you ever accepted God's Son into your heart? Have you ever called Jesus the Lord of your life? If you haven't, this would be your opportunity. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. For as many as believe upon him, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God. You're never too young, you're never too old. Today's the day. We're going to pray, every head bowed, no one looking around. Let's pray together, say this with me. The Bible says we can pray one for another. Again, if you don't know the Lord, would you pray? If you say, Bill, I've known him, but I've wandered in my faith. Reaffirm your faith this morning, would you pray? Let's pray together. Say this with me, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. I believe he died for me. 
Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Old sin, old hurt, old habits. They're all passed away. Everything's new. Thank you for a brand new life and a brand new beginning. Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm following you. Take control. And thank you for saving me. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.